Yeah. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, welcome to webinar six in our series of support for hospital opioid use treatment. Um, I'm going to kick things off by just reviewing a little bit of uh, where we have been and where we're going with this program, and then we'll go ahead and get into the meat of the presentation. Um, we do review this in every session just because we know we're picking up so many new participants every month, um, and we're so glad to have you all joining us for the first time. Um, so Support for Hospital Opioid Use Treatment, or SHOUT, is a program that really aims to increase access to addiction treatment and specifically to medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder. Our goal is to help hospitals and inpatient settings start patients on methadone and buprenorphine and bridge them into maintenance treatment. Um, the way we work is we're kind of a capacity building organization. And um, so we partner with a local hospital champion usually, and then UCSF and CHCF and the SHOUT organization gives you support in the work that you're doing to expand this. We welcome anybody from inpatient medicine, surgical, or maternity care services, and we'll be with you along the way of implementation. Um, I just want to point out a couple resources that we have available. We're learning that some folks haven't yet had the chance to explore our resources. Um, please, by all means, go to our website, um, which is, um, you can go to our Google Drive at tinyurl.com slash shoutshare and see all the materials that we've produced to help you along the way. We have a total of seven webinars that we'll be producing, and after every one is done live, it'll be posted online um, so it can be viewed as a recording after the fact. We've established inpatient buprenorphine and methadone guidelines, as well as guidelines for how do you manage pain and how do you get through surgery for patients who are on methadone and buprenorphine already. We're developing a series of patient handouts, frequently asked questions, particularly related to those legal questions, and those administrative questions, sample PNT monographs, and then some grand rounds templates as well. Um, we're really encouraging folks at this stage in the game to reach out to us through the URL that you see at the bottom, tinyurl.com slash shoutneeds. And let us know where you're at. Are you just interested in kind of learning more and want to view the webinar, but maybe not actually implement a buprenorphine method at your hospital? Or are you really looking to move forward with this? If so, let us know what you're looking for on that um, survey and how we can be of assistance. We're happy to come out and help you in any way. Um, our timeline, just so you all are aware, is that kind of November through January, um, we did a lot of didactics and webinar teaching about how buprenorphine works and the pharmacokinetics, and we've really moved on to more implementation phase. So talking with folks through webinars and through group coaching calls about how you can break down barriers and make sure that your patients truly really have access to these medications, not just how do you actually dose it. Um, we are currently on webinar six. We'll have one more webinar in this Removing Barriers series, and we're also holding monthly coaching calls that I'll tell you about more in a moment. Um, next, uh, in April and June, we'll also be offering um, kind of grand rounds and site visits. If that's something that's interesting to you, go ahead and share that with us on your implementation survey. I do want to point out the upcoming coaching calls, which you're all invited to. Um, so our next coaching call will be March 5th. That's for California hospitals that are in urban or suburban locations, and that'll be a small group coaching call where we can kind of talk through any barriers that you're facing. On March 6th, the following day on Tuesday, again at 12.15, um, there will be a coaching uh, call for rural hospitals. And I'm sorry, there's one correction here. This says it's California rural inpatient, but actually that's nationwide rural inpatient hospitals. And so please feel free to join us on the seminar if that's something that's interesting to you. Um, our next webinar, webinar number seven, um, is um, going to involve our pharmacy leadership and will also as well involve some discussion of telemedicine. We'll discuss that briefly today, um, but want to get into that in a little more detail in our next session. If you want to register for the upcoming webinar, please go to the link below. So I want to open it up today for today's panel. We're so excited to have um, a couple different panelists with us. And um, we're going to get things started with Diana Kappa, who is the um, Residency Program Director for the Family Medicine Residency at UCSF and an Addiction Medicine Specialist. And she'll be talking with you today about um, discharge planning and all the different ways after you start a patient in the hospital on buprenorphine that you can get them safely and stably on that medication in the outpatient setting. Um, because we know there are so many different barriers to care that folks can face. After that, we're really excited to bring you Andrew Herring, who is an emergency room hospital or emergency room doctor at Highland Hospital and has been working on a really excellent statewide project 
to encourage ER docs to get folks started on buprenorphine during their stays in the emergency room. Um, so with that said, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Kappa, um, who will go ahead and start to discuss the safe discharge planning. Great. Thank you. Uh, if you can, just a couple of, there we go. Thank you. We oh, do sorry. One invite more. Yeah. You to, yeah, I can do that. Um, we invite you to ask questions. We really want this to be a dialogue, and we know that these problems all have a local flavor and the solutions all have a local flavor too. So we want to work with you on thinking through what's really going to work for you locally in your setting. So um, to ask questions, please, uh, you should see a Q&A box um, at the bottom of your screen. You can type in a question there. We'll be tracking those questions throughout and then we'll be saving some time to answer them at the end. So ask questions. And if we don't get to them during this session, we actually do try to email people um, answers to their questions afterward. Right. Okay. So we're focusing on discharge planning, which may, may be the most complicated thing about all of this. Once you get used to starting people on buprenorphine, that can become quite straightforward. But having a good system in place for safe discharge, I think, um, is a whole other bridge that many of us uh, uh, have to put a lot of work into crossing. So what we're going to do today is look at multiple options for developing safe discharge plans for patients who are started on opioid agonist therapy in the hospital. Um, we're going to focus more on buprenorphine, but we'll, we'll talk to you about methadone. Um, and we're going to talk about options for providing discharge medications for these patients, because um, there are unique challenges there as well. So first, where can we send the patient for maintenance? Once we've started them, on treatment, what are our choices for discharge planning? And there are a number of different ways that hospitals have addressed this problem. You can see them here, and we're going to dig into each of these uh, for a few minutes. So some hospitals focus on sending patients to kind of a hub where all discharges go. Everyone who started on buprenorphine goes to the same place after discharge, and then from that hub, they get sent out to spokes later. Um, others discharge patients directly to primary care or directly to an addiction specialist. Others have a bridge clinic in their hospital that actually bridges people to maintenance therapy. And then others are exploring using telemedicine to continue to provide maintenance for people um, after discharge. So we're going to take a look at each of those for a minute. Um, we'll start with the hub model. So the hub and spoke model is becoming um, actually a pretty dominant model for buprenorphine treatment uh, in the community. Um, this model essentially starts with some kind of hub clinic. It may be a methadone clinic, it may be a buprenorphine hub clinic that then works in collaboration with primary care clinics, mental health clinics, hospitals, emergency rooms, maybe jails, uh, maybe residential treatment programs, maybe pain clinics. Um, and can start patients on treatment at the hub and then send them out to maintenance therapy in the spoke clinics once the patient has stabilized. Um, the other thing about the hub and spoke model is that if a patient has been stabilized at the hub, discharged out to the spoke to receive maintenance therapy, if the patient becomes unstable at the spoke, often they'll go back to the hub for restabilization. So it's a nice model for providing some specialty support to more primary care oriented people who might be providing the maintenance long term. Um, if you go to the next slide, the hub and spoke model was actually pioneered in Vermont, which has developed a really robust hub and spoke system. This is an image from Vermont's hub and spoke model. So they have these high intensity hubs, uh, which then send patients out to the lower intensity MAT spokes. Um, SAMHSA has taken this model and run with it. So they are funding hub and spoke programs throughout the country. I have a link here for all of the hub and spoke programs that are being funded nationally by SAMHSA. So whatever state you're in, you can click this link, see what's going on in your state and see if you can find a spoke, a hub near you. If you have a hub near you, you can actually work with that hub, set up a, a an agreement about them taking your discharges from the hospital, and they may be able to just take anyone who you start in the hospital, take them on after discharge. 
stabilize them, and then they figure out who's going to see them long term for maintenance. So that's kind of a, an optimal model, I think, in many ways, if you have a hub nearby. If you go to the next slide, this is a map of California showing the current hubs in California's hub and spoke system. Um, so what you have here are the specific hubs and then the catchment area for those hubs. So you notice one of the weaknesses of the hub and smoke mo spoke model. If you have a hub near you, if you have a place that's providing specialized buprenorphine treatment near you, your patients can be discharged there. If, on the other hand, your nearest hub is two counties away, that hub and smoke bottle doesn't work so well for you. Some municipalities have created their own, I'm gonna go back just one slide, Hannah. Um, some municipalities have actually created their own hubs. So if your official California hub is a couple counties away, you might look for some clinic in your town or county that is willing to act as a hub that has an addiction specialist there who's willing to take these patients on and stabilize them and then discharge them uh, to primary care for longer term therapy. So I think still the hub and spoke model may work for you, even if you don't have an official hub in your area, uh, but you may have to actually work on, on helping them build an effective hub. We go to the next model. So the other model that I think is quite common is discharging people directly to a primary care provider with an X license. So directly to someone who has a primary care medical, a patient-centered medical home and can take the patient on immediately. Next slide. If you wanna do that, what you need to do is identify which primary care providers in your area have X licenses. And then we encourage you to reach out in advance to those primary care providers. So this might be like an email to all the PCPs in your area who have X licenses and say, can we establish protocol for discharging patients to you? Can we get a commitment that you'll be able to see patients within three days of discharge and then tell us what the, what the pathway should be for those really straightforward discharges for these patients? I've also provided, I think if you hit the next slide, yeah, this is a link to uh, SAMHSA's Medication Assisted Treatment Physician Locator. So here, you can click on this link, type in your zip code, and find all the providers in your area who have X licenses. From there, someone on your team can contact them and say, okay, who's willing to partner with us and help us establish a pathway to discharge? If you go to the next slide. Similarly, some places have found that it's easier for them to partner with an addiction specialist. So maybe the primary care providers don't feel like they can make a commitment to take patients within three days of discharge. So instead, you find an addiction specialist who you might find through the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry or through the American Society of Addiction Medicine, or again, through that SAMHSA buprenorphine provider locator. And again, work with them to establish a discharge protocol and to get a commitment to see patients within, within a few days of discharge. Next slide. Another option that, uh, that some hospitals have built in is de actually developing a bridge clinic in their hospital. So this, um, this is actually a fairly common strategy too. Some places find that they just can't find the partners in their community who are willing to take patients so quickly. Um, and so instead they have to develop a bit of a bridge clinic in their own system to stabilize patients while they work on getting them into a PCP. To the next slide. So there are a few ways people develop bridge clinics in their system. One, if you don't have X licensed providers, so that's the left hand column, you are gonna use the 72 hour rule to be able to continue to dispense buprenorphine to patients while you wait for them to get into maintenance therapy. So without an X license, you cannot prescribe buprenorphine to outpatients. When they're, once they're discharged, you can't prescribe it. What you can do is dispense it once daily for no more than 72 hours. So the patient has to come back every day, be dispensed a medication, be seen by somebody. You can do that for 72 hours. You can make a short little bridge there. Um, I have included here a link to the rule from the DEA that says that it's okay to do that, even without an X license. 
It is also okay to do this with methadone, actually. The same rule from the DEA applies to both methadone and buprenorphine. If you do have an X license, for the buprenorphine patients, you can actually set up a bridge clinic where you see patients maybe daily, maybe weekly, depending on what their needs are and how stable they are. Uh, so this is, there are models where um, there are actually nurse practitioners or physician's assistants seeing patients in bridge clinics after discharge to stabilize them and help them get into primary care providers so they can manage patients for a week or two until they can get in and see somebody. Uh, for patients on methadone, that is still not an option. You really only have the 72 hours before you have to get them into a methadone treatment program. So if you're starting patients on methadone, you really do need a relationship with some methadone clinic, essentially some hub that can see people within 72 hours. Um, a couple of ways people do the, the bridge clinics then. Some use their pharmacies. So it may be that your hospital discharge pharmacy takes patients, patients drop in to the pharmacy on their post-discharge day, the pharmacy calls the prescriber who writes the prescription, and the pharmacist observes the dose if it's a 72-hour uh, ex-license-free situation, or if, it's, if there is an ex-license, they can just dispense you know, two to three days' worth or a week's worth of medications directly from the pharmacy. So that's one model that gets used. Another model that gets used is that people carve out a little bit of space in the emergency room. So the patient drops into the emergency room, is triaged to a low acuity care, and again, the medication is either dispensed or prescribed, depending on whether there's an X license. Other, other hospitals have actually set up a separate clinic where they do this, uh, but for most, the volume is low enough that they, they tend to use uh, systems that are already in place, so the pharmacy or the emergency room. And then the other option that people are really beginning to explore right now is the use of telemedicine. So once we've started a patient on buprenorphine, particularly in the hospital, can they continue to receive care from a telemedicine organization rather than having to find um, a sort of a brick and mortar clinic where they can get in quickly? So I've put here an image. This is from Bright Heart Health, uh, which is a, a telemedicine organization that does buprenorphine prescribing and is local and, and has a good reputation. Um, there are others, and so I'm not saying that they're the only ones, but this is one that I'm aware of that actually will prescribe buprenorphine for patients on, on very short notice. So developing a partnership with a telemedicine organization may be another way to get your patients uh, the rapid follow-up that they need after initiation. The other one, um, so then providing discharge medications for people. So I've referred to this a little bit already. If you have a team member in your hospital who has an X license, you can just prescribe them sufficient medication until their next appointment, depending on which model you use. If you don't have a team member with an X license, you can do the bridge clinic with a 72 hours. Um, you can arrange with their maintenance provider to prescribe. So if you have a relationship with a hub or with a primary care provider who is willing to take your patients after discharge, some places will call that provider on discharge and, and have them actually write the discharge prescription. That is an option. The other thing that some hospitals have done is have an in-house buprenorphine team, uh, which might be an addiction consult service, that might just be a buprenorphine team that actually provi provides discharge prescriptions for patients. So even if none of the hospitalists or emergency physicians have X licenses, that in-house buprenorphine team can be called to just write the discharge prescription for people. Um, the other option that I didn't put on here but is worth mentioning is buprenorphine in high doses, so 32 milligram doses, seems to work uh, as a medication that you can take every three days. So there are a few studies showing that you can actually maintain people on Q3 day dosing if you're using high doses. Um, so some places are using that to help bridge people to maintenance therapy. So they will start, they will discharge people with a 32 milligram dose. You take that 32 milligram dose before discharge, and then you've got three days before you need to get into care somewhere else. There's a lot of options for bridging people through, and I think you as an organization need to think through what your local resources are and which options are really gonna work best for you and your team. 
And I'm going to turn it over to Andrew Herring, who has actually used a lot of um, these options that we've talked through because the, the specific challenge, challenges in the emergency room where he works are even more, more complicated sometimes than the hospital. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for that overview. Uh, and I'm happy to talk a little bit more about uh, how we're doing things in the emergency department. Next slide. So I'm an emergency physician. I spend most of my time in the emergency department. And now I'm also spending a lot of time throughout the state working with hospitalists and emergency-based physicians and community-based physicians to set up systems of care for the initiation of buprenorphine and the maintenance of it once you've got it started. Next slide. What we see is that there often is a, a gap between where people are coming in, be it the emergency department, clinics, urgent cares, hospitals, and then the developing constellation of ongoing care. Some of these gaps are physical and they just don't exist in the county. Other of these gaps are purely administrative. Their insurance isn't set up. They, they, don't, they can't get into the clinic or people are, there's a referral system that, that's um, uh, awkward or something like that. So the emergency department has a long role as the safety net for the emergency department where it's often that one creates these ideal systems where ideally uh, someone with an opiate use disorder recognizes that there's a great walk-in clinic and just goes straight to the clinic, gets started on, on buprenorphine, their life comes together and they go off and become a happy, happy uh, productive citizen. In reality, it's m usually much more complicated that even the best uh, in created systems with lots of funding, often there are people who fall through the cracks, and then there's just people being people. Uh, they end up in crisis of some sort or another. And in the community right now, the general perception is that the ER, the emergency department place, is somewhere where you can go to get help. And that's the role we're really trying to fill, is you walk in the door and we're gonna try to do whatever we can to get you to the next step in your, in your progress of harm reduction and initiation of treatment. For example, just last Friday, I took care of a very charming, uh, charming person. He actually came into his visit with his, uh, with his wife and his, his young child and was looking great. And the, uh, the story was that he managed to somehow ended up in an emergency department in the valley that I had never heard of and had no idea that they were starting a program. And he had presented there in withdrawal. He was started on buprenorphine at that visit. Then he got to Alameda County, didn't know where to go, came to our emergency department, got a refill, um, a treatment and refill prescriptions, and then he saw me two days later in an, an outpatient setting. Then from there, I saw him and passed him on to our uh, buprenorphine induction clinic. So these chains of care um, can be complicated, but just the reality of people's lives are such that we need this kind of flexibility in the system if we're really going to meet our population level goals and really increase access to this life-saving treatment. Next slide. So I have a unique perspective in that I have a, a clinical time in the emergency department in the pain and addiction uh, ambulatory specialty clinic where I specialize in pain there and do some addiction. And I'm also the medical director for our outpatient substance use disorder program where it's, it's all in a more of a community-based kind of walk-in uh, sort of milieu. Um, and I end up also get pulled into perioperative medicine. This gives me the ability to have a multiple perspectives on the, both the problems that can arise and the advantages of providing buprenorphine in these various circumstances. Next slide. So the actual research on using buprenorphine in really in most settings is fairly thin. In the emergency de department, that's more than true than else, elsewhere. The basic principle is many people present to the emergency department in withdrawal. 
So in working with the emergency departments, what I really like to do is simplify things and not get people to think too meta about all this in terms of what are the long-term goals of care? You know, what does it mean to be in recovery? What's the difference between maintenance therapy? And, and what about people who want to detoxify? And what about 12 steps? And all of these questions are somewhat irrelevant in the, 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 set, the sense that people in opioid withdrawal need treatment. The buprenorphine, treating them with buprenorphine for their withdrawal and initiating opioid substitution with buprenorphine are clinically the same thing in the emergency department. So this has been uh, done for quite some time in various emergency departments. This is from Johns Hopkins in 2007, where they're simply just treating patients in withdrawal with, with buprenorphine. This emergency department has intravenous buprenorphine, which is a wonderful medicine that I would encourage all of you to get onto your formulary the, to treat withdrawal. The take home of this small study is that basically once you start offering buprenorphine out of your emergency department, you don't have a ton of re repeat visits. It does not become this uncontrolled horde of patients banging down the doors to get to the ER to get to the buprenorphine. Uh, as a advocate for buprenorphine, I wish that were the case, but in the reality is, is that they found in this study that of all these patients who were treated for their withdrawal with buprenorphine, they actually had a lower return rate for those controls that, that were not treated with buprenorphine. Next trial, next slide. Now, uh, this, this is a, a slide which addresses another issue that's emerging in emergency medicine, which is what do we do with overdoses? Uh, overdoses right now have a relatively, or I shouldn't say relatively, have a quite a high mortality after reversal. The reversal with naloxone is a very painful experience that can last for days. The, if it were, and it can occur in people, even you, know, you or I or anyone, if we're started on a fentanyl infusion and suddenly reversed um, and thrown into a precipitated withdrawal, you know, it, it is a very, very unpleasant thing. Um, <clears throat> so what we're finding is that patients are reversed on naloxone by, by bystanders, EMS, etc., and then they instantly go into this state of dysphoria, actual hyperalgesia or somatic pain, and are in the farthest away from any kind of uh, receptivity towards intervention, initiation of therapy, as you can imagine. And so people kind of write them off. We think that a lot of this is pharmacologically induced, secondary to the, to the, the reversal with naloxone, and have begun to use buprenorphine uh, in combination with naloxone as part of the actual resuscitation procedure. It's emerging and new, but we're really hoping um, a team of us with the National Institute of Drug Abuse are really interested in this idea of using buprenorphine and initiating it as part of the overdose management. So to be continued there, but that's something that emergency departments will probably play a role in in the future. Next slide. Now, this is the, the main study that's been done out of the emergency department. It's an interesting sort of event in, in academic and uh, clinical medicine is that the only trial really that's out there happens to be a gigantic you know, government-funded randomized control trial that's published in JAMA. It uh, was done in Yale by the team led by Gail D'Onofrio, who's the chair of emergency medicine there. And it simply just took people coming into the emergency department who were, had some sort of um, moderate or greater opiate use disorder and compared give, offering them buprenorphine, both administered and as a three-day prescription, versus folks who were simply given the motivational interviewing uh, and a uh, referral number to, to, to use. And clearly the addition of medication-assisted treatment as we see throughout the medical setting improves in retention and treatment. And in this case, it was 30-day retention and treatment increased from 37% in the group that did not receive buprenorphine to 78% in the group that did receive uh, buprenorphine. So really, really high rates that we see now clinically in that you know, honestly, in a lot of ways, you know, the model of hubs and spokes implies this idea that, that 
you know, initiation leads to stabilization, leads to, you know, ongoing um, stability, but often we see a more complicated course. And the first few weeks of treatment can actually be some of the easiest time, is that there's a honeymoon period where people really want to get off the dope. And offering treatment in the emergency department can take advantage of that. And get, so getting them to that first appointment, getting them to the first two appointments, we find that that's actually easier than holding on to them for two, three months, et cetera. Next slide. When talking with our emergency physicians, you know, what we see is that we, we really find that it makes their life easier in the sense that haggling around opioids is a big deal in the ER. It's an open door that people can go, can just walk in and demand, request an opioid prescription. And as most of the medical field has moved away from liberal prescribing, liberal um, administration policies around opioids toward a much more uh, constricted approach, that led to a lot of fights in the ER as patient expectations for prescription administration was suddenly at odds with the guidelines uh, that were being adopted by ERs and hospitals all over the country. Having buprenorphine as an option becomes a compassionate avenue that you can take, knowing that if someone needs that Norco because they're dependent and likely addicted, you can do more than just say no. You can actually offer them an integrated a treatment approach that takes advantage of that moment in the ER to initiate their medication-assisted treatment. So we are now in, or I should say that I've had most of my experience here at a county hospital where our nursing staff is not the, you know, they are not naive. They are not um, uh, starry-eyed. They're a little bit of a cynical bunch sometimes. And in rolling out various initiatives around this kind of thing, there's a lot of cynicism. But this program in particular, versus some other things I've tried, has been really wonderfully received by our nurses and the whole staff because it takes someone from being angry and demanding and just a, a nowhere interaction into something that becomes collaborative, supportive, and they see people feel better and become respectful and generally has been promoted uh, by almost all the staff, which is kind of exciting to see. And you're gonna see that in your ERs too, most likely. It's a pretty common experience. Next slide. So the, here, the, um, some of the, the different um, patients that are gonna come in um, are gonna need a different approach. I just briefly wanna say that the low hanging fruit is over on the left hand side here, where the, it's the patient who comes in actively seeking treatment. I actually didn't know this patient existed until we started offering the service. And that by letting the community know that you offer this service, there were a lot of folks who just started coming in that really may have, because of stigmatized attitudes or not knowing, was, not knowing how they were gonna be treated, would kind of keep this to themselves. So the other thing that happens is that some of these other more complex patients, the drug-seeking patient, quote unquote, um, who's seeking um, relief of their withdrawal can actually jump over to that group of actually seeking treatment. And instead of pretending that they have appendicitis and right lower quadrant pain and getting IVs and antibiotics and CT scans and all this kind of stuff, they actually just throw a strap about it and they just tell you that actually they're in withdrawal and they need help. These other two cases, the overdose case and then the chronic pain patient are much more complex. The, that require more partnership, usually require a little specialty pain medicine, et cetera. So if, when you're getting started, start with sort of the left-hand side here. Next slide. Okay, so this is where we've kind of ended up here um, in terms of how we approach it in the ER. So first step um, is, or I should say the first two steps, basically who do we do this with? We have really moved away from any restrictions. The, the idea is that we want to expose everybody to the potentially uh, helpful effects of buprenorphine, and we're really not trying to uh, exclude anybody. So if they're homeless, if, they, um, you know, if they're on benzodiazepines, all this stuff, we do not exclude them. They just really basically, we don't need a commitment to be on buprenorphine for the rest of their life. They just have to be willing to accept the treatment. 
and have a moderate or severe opiate use disorder, and that's it. Um, so then if, the, uh, if they're in, we'll just go down this in withdrawal route, because this is where a lot of our patients come from. The, if they're in withdrawal, and cows is one thing you can use. It's, it's certainly a tool that can be helpful, but it's not a requirement. Once you get the hang of this, you can eyeball with opioid withdrawal pretty easily. We just want to see real withdrawal. Uh, so diaphoresis, anxiety, yawning, runny nose, all this kind of stuff. We don't need to do any testing. We don't do urine toxicology testing. We don't do urine pregnancy testing. We don't test LFTs. All that stuff is not required in the emergency department. Later down the line for maintenance, it is. They're given a sublingual dose of buprenorphine. We usually give eight milligrams. There's really no reason to start with four, honestly. The, you give them four, then you determine if there is a prescriber, just like <clears throat> we were listening to, the, if you have access to a prescriber who can call in, who can see the patient, who can do telemedicine, who can come down, all those things, that's wonderful. If you've got that, you'll go one pathy. If you don't, which most ERs will not have, then we go ahead and we initiate this rapid start and give another dose of buprenorphine. Now, if they have next day availability, you could get away with as little as an additional eight, so a total of 16. Even that, many people are gonna chew through that quickly uh, as they're initiating. So most people, we give an additional 24 milligrams, which seems like a lot, but because of the ceiling effect and the pharmacology of buprenorphine, I can tell you from direct observation, people look exactly the same between the step of getting eight and the after getting an additional 24, there's very little change. Now, then finally, the emergency department, just as any other setting, can be used for three consecutive days as a, to receive additional doses, which should be at least uh, 16 per day, the, and then as they make their way on to the treatment site. Here's where we might be a little bit off the, you know, also kind of leading the sort of harm reduction kind of strategy in that I call it the tyranny of follow-up. And then I see a lot of people that are really on the sidelines to initiate buprenorphine because they're so worried about what will happen if there's no follow-up. Our feeling is that any exposure to buprenorphine is a good exposure. So we do not require that someone has perfect follow-up. We don't have a, a stop at the beginning of this algorithm that says, if they don't have follow-up, don't treat them with buprenorphine. Quite the opposite, in that we want everyone to be treated. Um, and you might have someone who's not sure where they're gonna go, like the patient that I saw who had gone from two emergency departments and ultimately landed with me. So if you are able to create a, a beautiful, well-knitted, coordinated care system, that's great. But if, if you're not, it's still, it's okay. You know, if someone gets a single load of buprenorphine, it wears off over two or three days, maybe they find a treatment center you had no idea existed, maybe they leave the county, maybe it wears off and they go back to using, that's okay. Now they've been exposed to it, and what we know is that when people actually enter into treatment, exposure to buprenorphine is one of the strongest predictors of actual success, whether or not that was through a formal program or through diverted buprenorphine on the street. Moving back up to eight, if they actually do have a prescriber, someone who can call in, someone on staff, et cetera, then we usually just go ahead after they've been treated for their withdrawal, if they needed it, give them a naloxone reversal kit, talk to them about hep C and HIV screening. If you've got a syringe program, that's great. Talk to them about overdose prevention and go, go ahead and then give them a standard induction prescription, um, the, the usually four milligrams titrated to their, uh, to their state and give the prescription of at least three days, up to a week I think is fine. Over a week it'll start to maybe raise questions about diversion and such and we'll probably avoid that. And that is our, our basically our approach. Um, if there's any crisis at any point, the emergency department is always open and we really let our partners know, whether it's residential treatment, buprenorphine hubs, Everybody know that you can always come to the emergency department as a last resort and get treated if there's any gap in care. And that becomes a really nice outlet for all the other providers uh, in the system. Next slide. So that was basically our kind of approach. And I, I think I should probably wrap up there um, and uh, turn it back over to the team.
All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Herring. Um, so I think that was a really useful perspective for us to have because I think the majority of our participants here are hospital providers or clinic-based providers. Um, and I think that having our emergency room colleagues involved can be a huge asset, um, both to outpatient providers, to inpatient providers, and to our patients. Um, so we'll come back to a couple questions. I encourage you to type in any questions you might have into the Q&A box on Zoom, and we'll be going ahead and doing some questions with Dr. Herring right after this. And he's posted his email address here. Um, it, he is always very open to emails, and you can also check out his website at erpainaddiction.org. Um, which has really great resources for how emergency rooms can start to set these up. Next slide, please. Um, similarly, just giving you a chance to type in those questions. Um, if you have any logistical questions for us at Shout, if you'd like us to do a site visit, if you'd like us to do grand rounds, if you want to figure out more of the details about these coaching calls, send us an email. Um, also, please feel free to sign up and also to go through our implementation survey that we discussed previously. Um, we will, as usual, be sending out an email after this session, um, which will have a link to the webinar recording, as well as PDFs and PowerPoints. Um, we're not picky. You can use our PowerPoint slides. You can use our PDF materials if you want to have any conversations with your hospital staff. That's fine by us. Um, our next email will also uh, give you more information about the group coaching calls and how to web register for our upcoming webinar. All right. Um, so I think what we'll do now is have some questions for Dr. Herring. Um, so Dr. Herring, I just wanted to get started with asking if our participants who are hospitalists at California hospitals are interested in getting their emergency physicians on board with doing buprenorphine starts in the ED or just being more comfortable with buprenorphine management, how should they go about doing that? How can they support their ED colleagues? I think that one, I, I just want to reiterate that my I'm, I'm more than happy to talk with people about how to do that just in a, on a personal basis. And that Sarah Wendell's our coordinator can also, can also help coordinate that. So reaching out to us by email, phone, um, was, is a great way to start. The, the, the basic setup is you need a single champion in the ER and then a single champion in some sort of long-term or bridging clinic. So that with those two pieces, you can get to work. You know, there are, honestly, there are some folks where if you, even if you just have a single champion in the ER, you can get started and just go from there. But I would suggest that the, most hospitals will have some sort of opioid use uh, guideline, coalition, committee, something like that. And that what we find is most of the champions are coming out of that pipeline uh, around creating opioid guidelines and just reach out to them around the concept of buprenorphine and initiating buprenorphine and maybe send them that, the Gail D'Onofrio's article and the link that we've got set up and kind of get that dialogue going. What we find is that the, it really, some folks who are really sold on reducing access to buprenorphine, I mean, to uh, opioids in general in terms of changing prescribing patterns, it's a little bit of a pivot to go from clamping down on not prescribing Norco to people with, with musculoskeletal back pain, and then all of a sudden kind of opening up this new door of access to opioids. So conceptually, it can feel a little dissonant. And once you have, once you kind of get over that hump, um, then usually things flow from there. Great, thank you so much. Um, one other question that's been coming up for folks is um, mostly in this session, in our series so far, we've been talking about using sublingual buprenorphine yeah. um, as opposed to using IV or IM. And I think some of our listeners might be interested in hearing a little bit more about under what circumstances would you as an ED doc use IV or IM buprenorphine instead of sublingual? Yeah, I, so I, I love um, IV buprenorphine. And, it, you know, going back, you know, that, that's a, buprenorphine is originally developed as, an, as a perioperative intravenous uh, uh, analgesic. So it was developed with the hope that you could have an analgesic that would be safer than traditional opioids because of the respiratory ceiling. And it continues actually to be used quite extensively, uh, 
primarily in veterinary medicine, where they, they're really worried about desaturations and all this kind of stuff. And all. So the buprenorphine is 30 times stronger than, than morphine as an analgesic and has this wonderful safety profile in that if you can give someone any, anywhere from 0.1 milligrams all the way up to 16 milligrams as an IV push, and you basically have the same objective effects on level of consciousness and respiratory rate. So the, the in emergency department, we currently are, have a randomized control trial of 0.1 mg per kg intravenous morphine versus 0.3 milligrams IV buprenorphine for all comers with severe pain. This, the study's ongoing, it's all blinded, but I can just tell you, we're unable to distinguish between the two. So it, it functions as a equivalent to, to morphine very easily for just acute pain in general. So that's the first thing is that I'm really hoping that people do understand this can be a very effective medicine just to use for anybody, even if they don't have addiction. Then moving into the more of the addiction space, it's great for people who have nausea, vomiting, um, and are in severe withdrawal, unable to tolerate the sublingual formulation. It comes on quickly, takes them out of the withdrawal, um, and it fixes all those extreme symptoms, and then you go ahead and you can just proceed with down that pathway I talked about. That's the mi minority of patients. Almost all the patients we see, we see in, in the chairs, uh, quote unquote, meaning in our our fast track, uh, low acuity setting where people actually aren't in beds, they're just sitting down in a cubicle type environment. But if they're actually sick from withdrawal, we'll give them that. The, the other thing, which again is, is certainly more on the cutting edge of things, is that buprenorphine itself is a more avid uh, reversal uh, agent than naloxone. Uh, it's actually a more potent reversal. So you can use it as part of your protocol for reversing overdose in the ER setting and then use that as a bridge to initiating long-term treatment with buprenorphine. But that's, that's a little more complicated, but it's certainly something we're doing. Great. That's something I think we can really look forward to in the future, and I'm excited to see more data come out around that. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of questions now about um, how you pick the first dose of buprenorphine. So you mentioned a range dose of four to eight milligrams on that, on that algorithm, and there were a couple of questions from our participants about, you know, if a person uses four grams of heroin versus rarely sniffs small amounts of heroin, do you use different original doses of buprenorphine based on that? Yeah, that's a great question that, that um, I've really spent a lot of time on. Um, and th this algorithm is a little bit of a, of a, as many committee things are, a little bit of a concession in that, in point of fact, I never use four milligrams. Um, it's almost always eight, um, but the, th there is a whole body of experience and literature that primarily comes out of initiating buprenorphine in patients who are coming off of methadone, and methadone predicts a difficult induction. It always will, it always has, um, and that's distinct from this. Um, if you are on a short-acting opioid or even oxy, all this stuff, it, it's really a whole different ballgame much easier. So if you do have a methadone patient, you have to be quite careful to go slowly and, you know, titrating up as slowly as possible generally is the best way to go. That's not who we're, we're really seeing in the emergency department. So in, if, in someone who's using illicit uh, heroin or snorting or oxy, it, it really, um, you do not need to, uh, to titrate the initial dose based on what their, their daily use was. Um, the way what you'll see is that if someone is, you know, the, you know, just snorts a quote a little bit um, of heroin, for example, um, the, which some folks are, fall into that, they tend to be younger, you know, they're kind of just, they've just been into it for a couple of months or a year and they aren't using that much, but they're clearly in trouble. They meet criteria for the disorder. They, they don't feel differently in the moment, but they'll, it'll just last longer. So that's if, if I've given someone 32 milligrams and, they're, and they have a relatively mild disorder, they'll, they'll just be out of withdrawal for five days. Whereas if I'm working with someone who lives in an encampment and his, his, and his, uh, his buddies with the dealer so he doesn't have to pay for it, and he's like literally shooting three grams of heroin per day and has for the last 20 years, that person will chew through even 32 milligrams in 24 hours. So it, it just, it just uh, shortens the effect. But acutely, 
you, you don't need to titrate the dose. All of that complicated dose titration, none of it has to do with going too far. All of it had to do with this fear of precipitating withdrawal. Uh, and that's sort of the take home point. You basically can't go too high um, with the initial dose of buprenorphine. Yeah, um, thank you for that. I think the, the, the key point is what you were just saying there is we're, we worry about precipitated withdrawal. And depending on what situation the patient is in, there's a higher or lower risk. And for the vast majority of our patients, a single dose of eight milligrams is just fine to get them started um, for their initial dose. The, some circumstances that we don't so much discuss in these webinars are, like Dr. Herring was mentioning, the transition from methadone to buprenorphine, which can be really tricky. And also buprenorphine starts in patients who are predominantly being treated for chronic pain and don't so much have baseline opioid dependence. Those are both situations that um, if you have questions about, we can talk one-on-one, -on -one, but would be situations where you would likely use a much lower starting dose, such as a two milligram dose to get things started. You know, the only thing I would just jump in there, because I do a lot of chronic pain, um, and, and we, chronic pain, you end up using these smaller doses, but in the initiation period, if I've got someone who's on, you know, a bunch of oxy and Norco, and it, it, you know, we start them out the same. Um, it, it's really the, the exclusionary line we draw is, is purely methadone. So if you stay away from methadone, it, it, you, can, you can use this protocol just fine. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my, my point regarding which chronic pain was for people are now sometimes starting buprenorphine as a first line opioid for someone who's never been on opioids before for chronic pain. Oh, Those yeah. are the concerning circumstances. But yes, if a patient's been on opioids for quite some time and has a baseline tolerance, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. And is it, you know, so there are naive stu there are studies of giving, so it's just sort of understanding the safety. So um, one of our colleagues, Sharon Walsh, one of the early studies in 1994, just taking folks off the street, you know, you or I, and giving them 32 milligrams of sublingual buprenorphine. And the, you do fine. You know, you just have a little opioid -y kind of feel that lasts for a week. Um, so so e even in the naive patient, uh, it, it remains safe. But absolutely, yeah. you not want to start someone off um, on that for pain. Great. Um, I think the last question that we have time for um, is just trying to get a little bit of a sense of um, what this looks like on the ground for most of the patients at your ER, Dr. Herring. So yeah. if a patient gets this um, initial loading dose um, in your ER and is planning to follow up somewhere but doesn't have close follow up, um, do they come back to your ER on subsequent days um, or do you more just kind of give this dose and, and um, have them go from there? So in, our, in my ER specifically, we, we have very, very close follow-up in that it really couldn't be closer because I, I actually personally you know, can consult on them in the ED and then also see them. Uh, in the flesh, um, so to speak, in, the, in follow up. And in between, we have a navigator um, who's there you know, to keep track of them. So we have a really tightly controlled system because we happen to be blessed with those resources. But if, um, the, if someone didn't um, have these resources that, or they're leaving, you know, they're just in the ED and they're going to go to a different county, um, we would just go ahead and, and um, treat them. In the, in the places that, that, that we've worked with, we tend to have, at this point in time, have only set up systems where there is a, 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 a treatment center that, really, that can take them. What we find is it's just the weekends. So over the weekend, though, if they get you know, eight or 16 on, day, on Friday, then they come back to the emergency department on, Friday, on Saturday and Sunday, and then Monday at their clinic. If there is a, a, a snafu, they don't have their picture ID, or they had to you know, move their car because it was going to be impounded, or all this crazy sort of practical stuff that gets started that can prevent people from accessing prescriptions, um, they can always come back to the ED for a rescue dose. We have yet to have a single ED complain about repeat visits. So this is an often a big concern, but practically now with probably 10 emergency departments under our belt, um, has not not actually manifested as a problem. Great, thank you so much. Well, I think that's all the time we have for today. Um, feel free to email us at uh, project.shout.coalition at gmail.com and 
And also feel free to email Dr. Herring if you have any questions or want to get your ER physicians in touch with him and get things set up for, for your emergency room. And we look forward to seeing all of you at our next webinar in one month. Thank you very much.